All right, I'm live again. Uh, this is my first real live show that I'm going to try to give on TikTok. If it's a success, I'll do it more often. And uh, of course, I prepared a little bit to make sure that I can fill an hour or so with some uh, interesting information. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my book that I wrote four years ago already. Uh, it's called Eternal Struggle. So my full name, by the way, is Johannes Mathis Conrad, and you can find my books under my name, my author name, Mathis Conrad. So you could Google uh, Eternal Struggle, Exposing the Scientific Worldview. You probably find it on Amazon. <clears throat> so I wrote this book um, because if you want to attack the left-wing worldview, the liberal worldview, you're going to have to zoom in on the fundaments of their beliefs, which happens to be the scientific worldview. Now, I make a distinction between the scientific method and the scientific worldview. So I'll probably explain more of that uh, going through the book. Uh, I want to discuss the final two chapters of this book, um, basically giving you the, uh, the conclusion up front. And maybe I'll do other live sessions where I can go through the, the, the more elaborate arguments. They're a bit more technical arguments today. Uh, devised in the, in the first few chapters of the book. Uh, just briefly, let me check if, if the live stream is all working. You can check on my own TikTok account. Working. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes, it's working. Okay. Uh, so, repression of belief. What do I mean by this? Um, in a in a in a technocratic society, say, in a society that, sur that, is, that centers all around uh, economic activity, where the purpose or the raison d'etre of, of society itself is just to be economically productive to the economic elite. Basically, uh, you want people to spend most of their waking hours uh, working for money or basically working for, for the wealth of the leisure class, of the upper class. And... You do that by repressing belief. And I'll go through it, but you know, th the main idea here is that religious people are going to spend more time on religious rituals, on religious life, really, and less on economic life. And therefore, you have to repress or suppress religion in society in order to get people to basically start seeing the state itself as religion and to start seeing economic life, your 9 to 5 life from Monday to Friday, start seeing that as as your religion really and i think that is what has happened in the western world and the only way to really break out of this in my view is to restore a sense of religion among the people so uh, uh chapter seven it starts with a quote from james c scott the author of uh, seeing like a state professor scott professor scott is very intelligent and he can tell you a lot more about uh, how states operate and how states basically uh, uh, execute people. <laughs> I'm going to try to, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to respond to your comments as well. Uh, yeah, I speak with a German accent. Yeah, I don't know. I have lived in Germany, so maybe that's why. So James Scott says, the state remained as focused on the number and productivity of its domesticated subjects as a shepherd might husband his flock or or a farmer tend his crop. So basically, the state, especially big cities, are like a, a chicken pen, right? And people living in there are domesticated humans, and they are there for their economic economic exploitation. Now, if if sheep, if you own a couple of sheep, what do you do with them? I, guess, I suppose you can milk them, you can slaughter them for meat, and you can harvest their wool. What is it that states harvest from their domesticated citizens? They harvest your labor primarily because they're not butchering you for meat yet. So uh, a belief in God stands in the way of a people's loyalty to the state. So you're either loyal to God, your God, to your religion, or you're loyal to the state system. So the state has an interest in making you atheistic. You know, the whole atheist movement led by Richard Dawkins, for example, what is it really for? Well, by making people atheists, you make people believe in the state. So the state becomes uh, a different kind of God. Whereas devotion to religious rights leads people astray from increased economic activity. 
the state is only interested in maximizing its tax revenue by expanding through birth and conquest, educating and specializing the population. So I mean to say here, I, this is a bit, bit poorly written, but I mean to say that a state is a population machine that wants to maximize its economic output, mainly to the owners of that system, the, uh, the, uh, the overlords, the billionaire class. And, uh, but as long as people believe in God, they retain the possibility to resist the state's man-made laws. The religious resistors are a threat to economic state society. The state, therefore, has an incentive to centralize and control people's religious convictions. States see themselves as the directing force in charge of material reality. Since a divine spirit may not manifest itself materially, states have to dismiss religious beliefs as irrational superstition. They don't want you to believe in God. States, they say, are real and gods are not. People would be better off People would, people would be better off if they surrendered their faith and themselves to the economic doctrines of the state, the better life still promised to immigrants today. So more people are joining the live chat. Okay, I'm going to try to do both things at the same time. Here. I'll, I'll try to answer some of your questions. So for ages now, polytheism, or the belief in many gods, served as a guiding principle for diverse, decentralized, and stateless peoples. Their tribes transferred their core beliefs to younger generations through song, poetry, and rites of passage. It was impossible to speak of a top-down hierarchy that instructed people how to live. Basically, religion, um, religion came bottom-up. Basically, people uh, came up with culture and religion on their own accord. They didn't need state, states or governments to tell them what to do. So people had to learn to think for themselves, and they did, each generation anew. Ancient religions consisted of diffuse, diffuse collections of oral traditions born of small, illiterate communities who sometimes attributed their myths to a divine, to a divine founding father, like a sky father. And once people began, began settling down in cities, first in ancient Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, about five to 7,000 years ago, different nomadic faiths then melted together. And so what I'm trying to say is, if you have a melting pot, like in the USA, a melting pot of different people, but they bring different religions, all of a sudden you will have to, uh, uh, you are dealing with diversity, right? And that's a bit of a problem. So let me center this a little bit. Okay. Hey, hello. So as a consequence of urbanization, moving people into the cities, religions became more centralized. Uh, gods and goddesses such as uh, Tiamat, Jordan Peterson often speaks about Tiamat, the goddess of chaos, Inanna or Marduk and so on, became the chief gods of early states such as Uruk and Babylon. This is necessary because when you bring so many different people together in a, in a city, for example, with different uh, religious backgrounds, different cultures, and you still want to dominate them all, you're going to have to give them a central god. So that leads to the arrival of the first monotheisms. The first monotheisms were, <clears throat> were born of urban populations that required greater central oversight. And in an efficient economy, people must learn to think alike. Uh, or, there will be, or there will be too much chaos. And so nowadays we have like the belief in progress, right? The belief in progress, inclusion, diversity. This is what they want you to believe in. Uh, this is the state religion. So by the time Judaism and Christianity arose, religious beliefs had already been codified into state-sanctioned stone tablets. And cities, not the periphery, not the rural areas, became the centers of church power, ecclesiastical power. So... Um, it used to be so that in the ancient days, nomadic tribes, uh, an, an alpha male would rule them, or a big man, a big man cult. Then later you had maybe rural settlements where there are like small but still decentralized authorities here and there. It is not until the urbanization where you bring so many people together that you see real state authority arise. Uh, the Germanic peoples of Northern Europe, for example, they for a very long time have been a rural race. 
they did not urbanize uh, until recently, actually. So a rural people, Germanics, they resisted living in cities for longer than their southern European contemporaries. They never developed a unified monotheism of their own. The old um, Asatru, you know, or uh, the old uh, belief in Odin and Thor and so on never became a real monotheism. They, the old Germans always had their, their polytheistic beliefs. Christianity, however, cut the heathen short, and the northern city of Berlin finally reached one million inhabitants around the year 1880, that's just 140 years ago, almost 2,000 years after Rome did so in 50 BC. So you see that the southern Europeans urbanized much faster, much earlier than the, than the northerners ever did. YouTube also... Uh, a population disparity, right? There are fewer people living in the colder north and there are more people living in the south. But also, Rome uh, Rome has a water problem. So you have more people living together to drink the same water. Whereas in the rainy northern territories, people could disperse more, right? Uh, yes, I do support monarchy. I support a form of aristocrac aristoc aristocracy and uh, monarchism. Yeah, uh, I believe it may be the answer to the, the, the degeneracy that we see in our in our time today. So each Germanic community worshipped its own interpretation of a sort of loosely knit faith, the Asatru. But well into the 13th century, the Germanics still clung to their dispersed faiths in Odin, Thor, and Freya and a plethora of other gods and goddesses. So eventually Catholicism, however, the, the official religion of the Roman Empire, assimilated the northerners into its centralized religion as well, uh, as well as into its economy uh, until their barbarian minds broke free again after the Protestant Reformation of 1517. Yeah, Norway is beautiful. I've been to uh, the Hardanger Vida. I've been hiking there in the, in the snow. So today's Protestant Christians still believe in the priesthood of all believers, and it allows for one's personal interpretation of scripture, whereas Catholicism is a more centralized authority. So uh, and perhaps that is a remnant of a more intellectually more diverse past. Yeah. So personal interpretations, however, defy the official interpretation given by the church and the state and diminish centralized power. So the counter-reformation bring uh, served the counter-reformation, so there, you have the Protestant Reformation and the Catholics start to fight back. So the counter-reformation served to bring back free-roaming minds under the Vatican's control, and they have succeeded to quite a large extent. And in the end, whether intended or not, the Second World War broke, broke the back of the Germanic spirit, and finally, anti-Germanic forces achieved the near domestication of the Northern Europeans under the yoke of the European Union. Uh, I don't practice Asatru, but I, I definitely support the mythology of our people. Uh, I think uh, it is necessary because the biblical stories are about people wearing sandals in the desert. It doesn't really relate to us. So if you read the Edda, you notice, okay, these stories do relate to us. So that's very important to have your own, uh, your own uh, mythology, so to speak. So what progressive liberals now experience as progress is really the progressive assimilation of state-aversive peoples into the unfree economies of centralized city-states. Basically, cities are stables for domesticated people, and they don't want people to live in the countryside anymore. They don't want you to live off the grid. So what state officials call inclusion or inclusiveness, it really means one's obligatory inclusion into state enclosures, cities, walled cities, where states can measure and maximize the taxation of your productivity. They want to know how much you're working, how hard you're working, and they want to know, they want to figure out how much they can get you to work more for less. And since states derive all of their power from the people they tax, open borders and the false promise of a better life still serve to submit more people to state tax authorities. I mean, what do you think mass immigration is about? Mass immigration is about getting more and more people into your country to serve the economy of the overlordship, of the billionaire class. They don't care whether you're black or white, but they care if you're paying taxes. And they love people who are willing to accept greater poverty in exchange for doing more work for less. They love those people. So you ma imagine you have a middle class in the Western world that, doesn't, that wants to free itself from its economic exploitation. Well, 
then they're going to take your guns away and herd you into extermination camps. Yeah, Northern mythology, yeah, it's definitely, I, I like it very much because there, when I read the, the ancient Viking sagas, I recognize people like myself, you know, the way they think, the way I think, the way, the way we think. This is our people, of course, yeah. Oh, the Kalevala, yeah, definitely. So scientific atheism continued along with this trend by removing one or more God from its equation. So you go from polytheism into the urban monotheisms, and then you go one step further in our modern time, uh, is to remove one more God from your equations and to make people atheistic. So today, globalists dream of merging the remaining largest monotheisms together into a universal faith for all mankind. I think Pope Francis actually wants to fuse Islam with Christianity to create a sort of Christo-Islam or Islamo, Islamoanity, whatever, something, you know, chimeric, something silly. The godless submission to a world state, the most totalitarian system conceivable, globalist communism. So the global open society, that's Uncle Soros' favorite, uh, is also a prison from which no one can escape. If, if you have a global society, you can't leave. Now, now if, you, if you live in Germany and you don't like it, you might go to France, right? Or if you're in the USA and you don't like it, you might go to Canada. But in a global society where everything follows uh, under a sim singular set of rules, you can't escape. I heard that Serbians are like descendants of the Illyrians. It's also a sort of Germanic tribe. So I wonder how they ended up speaking Croatian. I think Croatian does have a little bit of a resemblance to uh, German, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, everybody in the North is uh, very atheistic, yeah. So, without God and without religious rights to attend to, people have little else to do but dedicate their waking hours to the economy. A godless society has disarmed people's religious resistance to a totalitarian government. So they want you to be atheist because it's easier to control you by making the state your religion. And so the law fought God and the law won't, like that song. No, I, sorry, I don't mean that. You know, I'm confusing Serbians with Croatians. It's all, it's all a bit of a mess to me. So the, the transformation from monotheistic to atheistic religions coincides with the transformation of human civilization from small, laissez-faire societies to an authoritarian civilization that wants to maximize productive human output. So states are population machines. They just want to maximize the population, but especially um, to make you more productive, to maximize tax revenues. States must increase their populations through slavery, through mass immigration, or higher birth rates. That's exactly the world we are living in today. If, if the native birth rates, birth rates are going down, they'll, they'll do mass immigration. If they can't get mass immigrants, by the way, they would have just reinvented slavery. They would just force people to have more children. So, as an ideology, Marxism serves this purpose best by redistributing wealth from the successful middle classes, the minority, to the poor majority. Think of South Africa where you have a successful minority and they tax them to death to feed a poor majority. I think there's like 7 million or 5 or 6, five or six million Afrikaners living in a sea of like 55, 60 million others. Right? So, Marxists didn't criticize Just a minute. So Marxists didn't criticize capitalism for its added value to society, but for its unequal distribution of accrued profits, uh, especially to women. You see, condemning the patriarchal and authoritarian nature of family as the principal source of social inequality. Right, okay. So if the Marxist state aims to maximize the population, young immigrant women deserve special treatment, see, since they alone can give birth. The older women can't birth, give birth. However, it takes a lot of time and effort to raise children to become taxable subjects. So there's a tipping point beyond which it, be it becomes lucrative for states to import adult immigrants rather than to invest in homegrown offspring. So we have already reached in the West this, this tipping point, right? Um, 
it is too expensive or more expensive to raise homegrown laborers and homegrown managers than to simply import a bunch of people from abroad and get them to do low cost work in the factories so that we compete with China basically. Uh, do you think they are trying to enslave black people when they come to Europe? Well, effectively, they're going to be working in the factory, so call it whatever you want, but it's slavery. So there is a tipping point. Beyond, uh, okay, so this is especially true for wealthier states than, that can lure immigrants in with the false promise of a better life. So as long as Europe still looks pretty, you have an, uh, you have a, an argument to lure in a lot of people to come here. But when they come here, as I just noticed, as I just mentioned, uh, when the mass immigrants come to Europe, what are they going to do here? Huh? They're going to get a, a basic income, but they will be ordered to work in the factory. So that's just slavery. The equality doctrine uh, assumes that immigrants will be equally profitable if only the natives wouldn't discriminate against them, right? So ignoring the real possibility that not all people are equal and that immigrant economies who deny this are at risk of driving themselves to ruin. The state doesn't care. Its accountants aren't looking to make societies livable. They only care about profits. Marxism expresses itself politically as a social democracy or a variant thereof. And by granting each person one vote, Marxist democracy guarantees that the fastest growing populations always end up winning political power. In other words, faster growing and more concentrated populations shall eventually win every democratic election. So the, this is the case already, right? In the USA, most people now live in the big cities. So the big city voters, <clears throat> if they vote along similar lines, and most of them do, <clears throat> they vote Democrat. And then the urban majorities, well, they win. Yeah, that's the point. You know, people from poorer places will always work more hours for less. But when you, when you go down that road, you're going to have to import more and more people who will work for less and less. And you're, you'll end up... The, turning your economy into a third world country, there's just no way, you, you can't go back. You'd have to start over to, instead of, can't go back. Yeah, Ursula von der Lying. There, have you noticed um, Maloney and all these politicians, all of them are controlled opposition, even the Pope, they're all globalists, they're all out to destroy Europe really. So our, our enemies, let's call them Marxists, they're as far-seeing as they are, they already knew this was going to happen. They knew they could breed their victories out of the masses, their victory out of the masses. Like their goal was always to complete the complete and total urbanization of the world and turn Erda, or Mother Earth, into a lifeless ball of steel and concrete, a Death Star optimized for profit. I think uh, in the movie Star Wars, the Death Star actually represents, you know, what... Uh, progressive liberals want. They want to progressively liberate you from organic life on Earth and turn you into a robot that serves as, uh, to be a gear in a Death Star, so to speak. But since more men than women die at work and in wars, women who also live longer have become electoral majorities. Did you know that in every city, in every major country in the world, women are the majority because men don't live as long. They die on, they die on the job. So by deliberately sending large numbers of men to war, states can artificially construct female majorities. So modern feminism wouldn't have existed without the First and the Second World War. Uh, these wars pruned so many millions of male soldiers of European men from existence that leftover women had to get jobs instead of husbands. Uh, I think we can't remove immigrants easily it would require a, a total war. <clears throat> so as a result, by pruning the least economically productive men from society, states can justify allotting more wealth to women and their offspring. Basically, men are robbed. Men lose out. <clears throat> more than any other ideology, Marxism and the feminism born of it um, has made men expendable assets. So father state has taken over the small town alpha male. Modern democracy is the dictatorship of people with higher birth rates, 
over people with lower birth rates, namely of women over men, of debt-free immigrants <coughs> over the invested natives. Like if you are, if you have to pay a mortgage, you're stuck with them, right? And if you arrive with nothing, it's easier. So, and of the young over the old. So families that have more children will naturally vote for policies that benefit larger families, which is socialism, at the expense of families who consciously decide to have fewer children to save more, which is capitalism. So democracy logically undermines the more financially responsible, though less productive middle class. Decline sets in, just as planned, for the state is constantly on the lookout to crush the unwanted competition. They don't want independent middle class people. A healthy middle class able to resist state doctrine gets in the way of a people's subjugation. States don't want middle class families to accumulate wealth and invest in their own future because it takes uh, money out of the economic system. Basically, if you're a middle class person running your own store, making your own profit and being able to save up to say a million dollars, you took that away from the billionaire. See, the billionaire class regards the middle class as thieves. All right, somebody asked what book is this? This is a book I wrote, uh, Eternal Struggle, Exposing the Scientific Worldview. Uh, I'm going through the final two chapters to give you the conclusion, basically. Maybe I can uh, put the book up screen a little bit. Uh, yeah, wait here. I'm going to try to make this a bit smaller so people can see it kind of eternal struggle all right all right so now we also understand why scientific atheism has become the dominant state ideology to maximize a people's economic output a society has to follow the rational mathematical and scientific principles that guide it to greater financial efficiency. Indeed, Karl Marx wanted his ideology to be scientific because he understood that scientific advances would help maximize the economic output of the working classes. So basically, it's all about squeezing out people to get them to be more productive. And there can be only one way to organize an economy most efficiently. State planners, therefore, cannot allow a popular belief in a God that expects people to live a meaningful life, to make time for contemplation, to perform one's religious rites. State, bureau state bureaucrats have reason to extirpate any economically wasteful custom or tradition. Any attention diverted away from economic activity is a loss of tax revenue. Yeah, it is. It's all about destroying the family but really to replace like economically stronger people like the, the Western middle class, replace them with the immigrants who are in a very weak position because they arrive with nothing. So they can be much more easily turned into clay, so to speak. So the progressive liberal desire to liberate people from their identities, histories, and even their genders serves state profits. Uh, I wrote this book like four years ago. And indeed today we hear about Africans apparently building Stonehenge, right? So they're, they're literally destroying our history, rewriting everything. So, but why bother rearing children when we can clone fully grown adults? I think cloning will also happen, by the way. They're doing immigration now, but when immigration isn't enough, I think they're just going to clone people in factories. I think they're really going to do that. So the socialist capitalist obsession with efficiency has eroded a more traditional and spiritual life. And that's my point of this chapter. Uh, it has placed a more human life out of reach. It has priced the, the working classes out of a meaningful life. People no longer care for God. They live and work for the state. The scientific worldview denies people can have a free will or a soul. Only behaviors that add to economic wait, that add to economic uh, progress are permissible, e.g commercial entertainment. You're allowed to have entertainment as long as you pay for it. You can go to the cinema or you go to the zoo. Anything you want to do in terms of entertainment has to be something you pay for. You can't have like your religious ritual that is free of charge that you just perform with your locals. No. You got to go to the dance festivals and pay $100 for the entry. So socialist states 
promote the most debauched forms of pornography, not because it is liberal, but because the industry generates taxes. It's all about money. In the absence of religious mores, money has become the measure of what is socially permissible. If it makes money, it must be good. This is called mammonism, and it dictates urban morality, or the lack thereof. Scientific society is at war with the soul of the world. People have become nine-to-fivers, empty vessels waiting to be filled with pre-programmed behaviors. Whereas a belief in God permitted a degree of personal interpretation, the scientific worldview preaches only one truth. Uh, a theory of everything, namely whichever is most efficient. In a scientific economy, there is no room for non-commercial law. Basically, a city is a word. Yeah, I live in a big city. Uh, I want to get out of here. Yeah. All right. Bottom left corner. Can I do that? Make it a little bit smaller. Though. Does this work? Oh, wait. Shit. Right corner. All right. You're right. Do like this a little bit. Let me check on the. Let me check on my phone what it looks like so I can see. All right. Wait. Uh, on my phone, it needs to be a little bit here. All right. Yeah, Dutch farmers are being driven out of their, their homeland for several reasons. I think um, they are the number one meat producer in Europe, but they also are the number one exporter of meat to Africa. So I don't know what the deal is here, but they definitely don't want people to eat meat anymore. So they're just cracking down on it with all sorts of bullshit reasons. So this is what I call the science delusion. It's the belief that scientific progress leads to human progress. It doesn't. In reality, progress leads to the end of humanity. Technological progress has replaced horses with automobiles, bank tellers with ATMs, all right, and soon people with robots. The Hollywood obsession with humanoid robots is state-funded. Why spend 25 years of investments raising a human soldier if you can have assembly lines produce new armies by the hour? The problem with autonomous communities is that their members can work together to resist the state. Uh, states must crack down on any form of social bonding people might develop, including but not limited to bonds of race, gender, nation, language, dialect, culture, motherly love, political conviction. They don't want you to have any kinds of linkages to anything at all, to any people. They don't even want you to have friends anymore. So the more atomized the population, the easier it can be controlled. So when Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson suggested that young men of the West, or European men, ought to be radical individuals pursuing their rational self-interest, he meant to diffuse their potential for fighting the materialist state. Rather than forming a sort of guerrilla army to fight neo-Bolshevism, Peterson's followers will be wasting their lives trying to make money. Yeah, we can fight back. We can fight back. You know, uh, the Spartans really did fight there at the hot gates and they really did stop the Persian army. Anything can be done with small numbers of extremely motivated men. So that's what we got to do. We got to get organized. Marxists say people are supposed to pursue their rational self-interest. But in reality, atomized individualism is what enables states to crack down on organized resistance. So where exactly does individualism come from anyway? It comes from uprooted urban individuals who go about the city each day without ever meeting the same face twice. Urbanization has trapped people in an eternal state of loneliness. Eventually, it shall become impossible to escape the artificial environment of urban centers. There will be addictions and degeneracy, porn and debauchery, insanity and crime, but there will be no natural forests, no lakes, no mountains to climb, no self-reflection, no personal growth, and no one to love or care for. Yeah, definitely, I will do more live streams. I'm going to talk about what we can actually do, how to get organized, but I have to really watch my language there because it, TikTok is, you know, they're going to censor you. Well, the whole woke perspective is insane, so 
but I think all you mean the woke people they think if you fall in love and you want to get married and have kids and live in a law cabin they think that's insane they don't understand that people just want to have the freedom not to have to live in a big city for example they think that's insane they want to they want to break down the uh, like this the suburbs you know where you have like your your home in a backyard where you can barbecue they want to totally take that away from you and force you to live in apartments in the cities so to justify individualism people embrace it and become radically individualistic religion being the social glue that binds communities and groups together states feel forced to promote militant atheism that's dawkins to disintegrate uh, the remaining religious resistance it's all about cracking down on people who have a internal locus right if you have an internal locus meaning you feel that you are causing the world to exist rather than you are being the product of the world they don't want that they want you to be a slave who believes that you are the product of the world they don't want you to think that you can actually create the world yourself through your own actions right Well, starting a movement, I've been trying to start a movement for 20 years and, and the majority of people are NPCs. They're not going to do anything. I think what is important is that we get organized with, say, the few people who are very motivated. They need to start finding each other. And it's very hard. So that's why I put my message out there. I hopefully that through my channel, people can find each other. Yeah? So it turns out that religion does serve a purpose. Rural, rural societies are sprawled out and decentralized, unlike the urban state. And without appointed human authorities, the state's expert or the scientists, in charge of distributing resources, small town people have to rely on themselves and on each other. Uh, small town people's ties are bound by their common belief in God. <clears throat> so religion acts as an internalized control internalized control means you believe you're in charge of the world you have a free will you are you are the the designer and the creator of your environment and if you don't like the environment you're in you can do something about it use your hands as your paintbrush do something about it you are the sculptor of your world so religion acts as an internalized control to help structure social relations with diffuse numbers of others uh, However, in densely populated urban areas, social complexity pushes societies to the point where only expert elites know how to govern. So as traditional communities become urbanized, the demands of economic efficiency force them to give up their local controls, their customs and their religious beliefs to the externalized control systems of the man-made state. For this reason, I believe that one's conversion to atheism always follows the surrender of one's autonomy to the state. Atheism is the state slave religion. That's my view. So mass democracy also has as a side effect that no single individual can make a difference. Politicians say that each vote counts, but somehow yours and mine don't count. The act of voting makes you complicit in the election's outcome and by extension in the crimes your government will commit in your name and against you the problem with universal rather than local democracy is that national politicians use election outcomes as an excuse to overrule local decision making universal democracy thus robs small town individuals of their autonomy which of course is the point since most people in the West now live in cities, democracy tends to favor urban majorities over rural resistors. Yeah, you know, the, the DSM manual, turns out a lot of these conditions are basically the same condition, and a lot of these conditions aren't really mental health problems, but really social problems. Basically, if you would move to another place, uh, or, you know, away from your bullies or away from nasty people, you would heal. So, so it makes perfect sense for urban citizens to rely on the state rather than on God, since city folks can no longer work the land required to grow their own food, and since they don't even have access to natural resources, a fresh water, uh, city dwellers robbed of the possibility of an autonomous life must rely on the vast and complex urban infrastructure only the state's bureaucratic apparatus can maintain. So what choice do people living in highly industrialized areas have but to submit themselves to the sole divine distributor, the state? 
father state. Atheism, as it seems, is both a consequence of and a precondition for the demands of economically efficient rule-based states. Functional states require a level of efficiency that leaves little room for inefficient religious beliefs. So in his book on primitive society, author Christopher Hallpike, and I recommend this book, On Primitive Society by Christopher, Hall, Christopher Hallpike, he explains, once it becomes necessary to maintain a central government, to allocate official tasks, to prevent rebellion, to raise and distribute the necessary revenues, to organize truly effective military forces, to organize large-scale public works, such as irrigation and so on, we are in a very different world from that of tribal society, and one that we can genuinely call functionally organized. If modern citizens complain now that they need to search their souls or travel around the world to find themselves, it's mainly because the state has already usurped their autonomy. Okay, referring back to this question from the comment about the DSM manual, I think the number one thing that causes you to have any kind of mental problem is that you have been robbed of your autonomy. It's basically when you, uh, you've, they've, been, they've made you a slave and all you can do is obey and follow orders and you have no more freedom. So try to turn that around and say to yourself, okay, I do have a free will. What happens if I start using my free will? It's going to be a bit scary, but you're going to be very healthy very quickly. States, of course, actively program children from the youngest ages to think of themselves in terms of their economic benefit to society rather than in terms of their intrinsic spiritual value. Even President Ronald Reagan, uh, a statist puppet, once said, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Well, that's a really disgusting thing to say because you know, if you for a moment would realize that people, if people would stop being radical individualists, they would hop over to their friends and neighbors and ask them what they can do for them. You don't exist for the state, you exist for your community. Our ancestors used to care to live and live to care. And to this, if we wish to defeat the state, we must return. We must return to caring for, our, caring for our tribe, our family, and our race. We are not here on this earth for ourselves. We are not atomized individuals. We are a part of a collective racial soul. We are here to fight for our people. We are here to care. And I think the number one problem in modern society is simply that of neglect. Uh, was it Kennedy? Okay. Yeah, people today struggle with not knowing what to do, yeah. I think a lot of people need more guidance. It used to be like your, your pastor or something, like your religious leader would tell you how to live and what to do. Nowadays, the state says you can do whatever you want. Any crazy act you want to participate in without your clothes on is fine. You know, as long as you just shut up and pay taxes, yeah, and that's just totally unhealthy. People need to know what to do. So admittedly, I found it hard to figure out how Marxist atheists actually look at religious people. So until I found a, an entry in the, uh, Sigmund Freud's book, The Future of an Illusion, by the word illusion, he refers to religion. So on a single page, the passage that I'm going to cite below um, explains the Marxist anti-authoritarian view, their belief in progress toward utopia, and the problem of social emancipation all tied together with the planned deconstruction of religion. So, I'm quoting Freud now. So, one receives the impression that culture is something imposed upon a resistant majority by a minority that understood how to take possession of power and by, co by coercive means. While humanity has made continuous advances in terms of controlling nature and may expect even greater advances, similar progress in terms of regulating human affairs cannot be determined with certainty. One might say a new re regulation of human relationships should be possible so that people could indulge themselves undisturbed by inner turmoil in the acquisition of goods and their enjoyment. So this final part, the last sentence, Freud believed that the purpose of life was to acquire goods and luxuries and enjoy them. That's just, that's just sickening. 
So Freud was a sort of conspiracy theorist who believed in an authoritarian minority who had hijacked people's societies to prevent them from accumulating stuff. Freud's bizarre theory resonated well with Russian communists of the time of the Soviet era who suggested that religion is supported by the bourgeoisie to sub subdue the proletariat. But it's not. Religion today is a tool to resist your state enslavement. This denies the reality that people, the proletariat, can have religious beliefs independent from their subjugators. It isn't true that all religions are imposed, imposed from above. Belief is what I call intrinsic thought. Beliefs are the convictions of people who have lived through the ages whose faith has withstood the test of time. Most traditional religions today come from within, from the kingdom of God within us. Yeah, Freud was a Marxist, of course. Precisely this is what scientific atheism denies. It denies that people can and may have an inner universe, a spiritual dimension. Like, do you believe the universe is just out there outside and you're just a part of it? Or do you believe that you yourself also contain the universe within? That's a very powerful thought. So what never occurred to the anti-authoritarians is that people cling to their religions in order to resist man-made authority. The real authoritarians, therefore, are the ones trying to disarm people's faiths and to get everybody to, da to dance to the state's, you know, Marxist tune. Yes, we can understand that skilled, aggressive, and informed minorities can hijack defenseless majorities, impose their false gods on them, and take charge of the proletariat's productive labor. And that's exactly what's happened since Karl Marx began pushing his so-called scientific society. What completely stupefied me, however, is that Freud thought that the acquisition of goods and their enjoyment was the purpose of life. Having first posited a theory of authoritarian culture and religion, Marxist materialists could then promote themselves as humanity saviors. Freud imagined removing the alleged authoritarians from power by liberating the masses from alleged suffocating reign of religion. The deletion of religion was going to set people free to accumulate goods unlimitedly, paid for with the loss of their souls. Was it all projection then? Did Marxists project onto their enemies their own darkest desire for economic power? Yes, that's what I think I did. Okay, I'm going to stop reading here. Maybe I'll do the next chapter for the next session, uh, maybe tomorrow or in a few days. Uh, let's see if there's anything else to discuss. So uh, got some questions maybe. I read Manic. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, I read that philosopher. That's, uh, I thought it was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Marxism is basically the, the guiding principle of our modern society. The state officials, the, the scientists. You know, did you know that the scientific worldview is exactly believes in has the same uh, assumptions, fundamental assumptions as Marxism, namely the belief that everything in existence is matter in motion, um, accelerating towards some utopia. And the only reason we haven't achieved utopia yet. It's because of fascists trying to standing in the way, and that's just nonsense. It's just total nonsense. Uh, do you think there's a big difference between American Christianity and European Christianity? I think so. In America, of course, it is a bit it's Protestant mostly, whereas Europe is largely Catholic. Uh, but another difference would be that in America, it's really overly commercialized. It's really something that you do uh, privately, whereas. In Europe, you still have a more of a communal sense of religion. I, th I think that's a difference. But, uh, I suppose I'm going to pause here then and uh, see you see you again next time, eh?